and we are live. So since people are still dropping in, it's my pleasure to say good afternoon to all of you that um, enjoy the webinar together with us. I'm grateful for your attendance in holiday season. It's our pleasure to introduce the last webinar of the Young Neurosurgeons Committee for this year. We have an expert panel of speakers and discussants representing several European countries, several generations, so to say. Um, I'd like to welcome the four speakers, Nora Dengler from Berlin Charité Neurosurgery, Claudius Tomei from Innsbruck Neurosurgery at the Medical University of Innsbruck, Sami Ridwan from the hospital Ibenbüren, and uh, Kant Asal from the company Non Notare, a German-based company that kind of mastered the metaverse for medical training and visualization. I'd like to welcome you to ask questions using the Q&A section of Zoom. We will try to um, respond to all the questions either after the talks in the short discussion or in the panel round in the end of the webinar. So the still participants coming in, but I'd like to welcome Nora Dengler from Berlin to start with her talk about empowering clinical and scientific education in neurosurgery. Christian, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm happy to join the webinar. And thank you for granting me the title, Empowering Clinical and Scientific Education in Neurosurgery. So in the next 10 minutes, um, I wanna tell you my ideas, thoughts and reflections on this topic. And first of all, I have to start with that I don't have any Thing financial to disclose. However, there may be a certain bias as I'm a middle-aged Western European woman, even a mother, in academic neurosurgery. So what does empowerment mean? Empowerment by dictionary is the act or action of empowering someone or something, the granting of the power, right, or authority to perform various acts or duties. And there comes another meaning with that if you trans translate this into other languages. In Germany, for example, there also comes in a meaning of personal responsibility with it. To be empowered means you need to have the knowledge, the confidence, the means or ability, <clears throat> and even <clears throat> and ability to do something. So knowledge means in neurosurgery, skills, teaching, you have to visit courses, you have to undergo certain mentoring, you need to gain experience, and you have to read yourself. Sometimes you even have to write yourself and to do, you do have to do yourself a lot of things. Confidence, yes, we can. You need to know to decide or to know who can decide. Sometimes you fail, you need to stand up again and you have to be better next time. Means and access for me is important as this, is the environment, the hardware, as well as the time and money that you need to fulfill your duties. And ability on a personal level means mental, intellectual, and physical capability to do things, personal interest and drive, also the personal freedom as well as discipline. And if you ask myself, I bring this down to some, for me, crucial facts. You have to read, write, you have to do to be empowered. You have to fail, you have to stand up, and you have to aim to be better next time. And time, as a neurosurgeon, if you work clinically and scientifically is crucial, time management also, and ability comes down to interest drive as well as discipline to develop. So let me reflect a little bit on time. Time in a sense of work life. This is a random example of a neurosurgical career, starting with a residency, coming to physician life, a lot of factors, just a few examples involved. First call, first call um, if you are a physician on the, let's say, more responsible side, for, um, thrive for scientific, thriving for scientific excellence, thriving for surgical excellence, maybe even thriving for leadership excellence, engagement in societies as well as department management, thriving for patient satisfaction. So there are some growing responsibilities coming. And in parallel, there may be also a personal life with hobbies, friends, hopefully Romans in the beginning, 
um, personal fitness, first tax declaration that you have to do yourself. Uh, maybe care for relatives, growing up a family, care for your home house garden, as well as remain fit personally. So to balance this and to fulfill your responsibilities, I think uh, a good time management is necessary for being empowered. There are some reflections that you learn from myself. This is from the educational division of the American College of Surgeons. So um, the empowered learner checklist means that you have an internal checklist. You know, everything, everywhere is our checklists now. Um, it, I think in the beginning there was only a codex and it has been there before uh, people made up their mind about checklists. So preoperatively, of course, you have to care for the patient, read about the patient, read about the operation, practice your applicable skills before in the simulation lab, discuss the case. So think it over by discussion. Um, try to gain autonomy or know where you struggle with autonomy. Uh, prepare the patient in the preoperative area um, and assist with everything before. And this then goes on for intraoperative as well as postoperative um, checking. My personal advice is be prepared as this is provided here in the checklist, reflect, play your strength, work on your deficits. This also means that you need to know what your deficits are, set yourself aims and go on educating yourself by webinars, courses, and so on. So this is um, a reflection on clinical empowerment. And if it comes to scientific empowerment, there are other people who have, has, um, have been making up their minds. Um, for example, um, they, it comes down to some studies that showed that if you start research early, you have to target high impact journals, participate in original clinical and laboratory investigations. This helps in your scientific development. And there is a nice study published in neurosurgery where this is nicely shown that the educational environment where you do your science does play a role. On the right hand side, you see a nice graph, which shows that the age index of your faculty, if this is high, then also the uh, research index from the residents is high. So a protected time research funding as well as travel support, also a positive sustained mentorship may be supportive for a successful scientific empowerment. However, I think it is very important to see that abilities and means may differ. So this can be interpreted on a cross-continental, cross-cultural, as well as a, on a cross-gender level. So this is a nice study that showed that training and cross-continental research productivity is different um, depending on the country where you're practicing in. So if you, for example, practice in Samoa, your research productivity is different if you are practicing in the United States or in Switzerland, for example. Also, some cross-cultural things may be involved. Um, these are just a few examples from studies that were recently published. And I think it is important uh, that we also understand that abilities and means may differ on a cross-gender level. So this is the 2003 paper from Deborah Benzel from the Wins in Women in Neurosurgery. And this is one of the first papers that shows that there are gender differences. So in that time, there were only about 13 residents um, with only a small but steadily increasing number. In neurosurgery, they were female. On the right-hand side, you can see a more recent publication of the situation in Germany. And you can see um, the percentages of women who are residents on the right-hand side. These are both about 35. And if you come that, um, if you come down or if you come up on the academic level, um, comparing this to chief senior physicians, vice director, as well as heads of departments, there are only 6.3% of female heads of department found in this study. So the percentage is falling down um, the higher you get in the hierarchy. And on a research level, you can see that there is some improvement on the left-hand side, you see the situation in 2009, and the pink bars are female, the blue bars are male, and there's a slight increase from 2009 and 2019. However, this is the a North American perspective, and there may be even differences in on a cross-culture and cross-continental level if you um, talk about the gender, gender gap. So for me, it is important that 
um, these biases have to be acknowledged, acknowledged and possibly fight it. How can you fight that? By giving um, support, by ally. And um, I think this has to be done on a institutional as well as on a society level and also on a personal level. So there are some reflections on mentorship. For me, this is not a one-way street, it has to work both ways. So the recommend, recommendation for a mentor is for me, staying open, staying open, staying open, be supportive and encourage, ask, also listen, be passionate, burn, don't burn out and reflect. And for being a mentee, it is important to be organized, to work hard, to stay open, to network, exchange knowledge, get support, also be passionate, burn, don't burn out and reflect. Thank you. Thank you, Nora, for that talk. We have a question that I personally would like to address later on the panel because it's about how it's possible to do research in low middle income countries. We can discuss about that later. We don't have any other questions, so I would like to go on with the talks and discuss the, some of the, the points you raised in, in the end because it's quite interesting um, and we can discuss a lot about that afterwards. So the next speaker will be Claudius Tomei from Innsbruck. He will be talking about the, how the ENS and the ENS courses in special influence the neurosurgical education. Hello, everybody. Thanks for having me. Um, it's always a pleasure to be involved in this. And uh, obviously, education is something that is important for me. Uh, being involved with the training courses for quite some time. Um, I'd like to quickly run through some of the part that you already probably know. Um, and then uh, my disclosures, I don't think shouldn't matter other than that I've been involved as a past chair of the training committee. So when we talk about are we fit for the future, um, it's going to be important to see what, where are we now, where, have we, where do we come from, and what is the role of the NS courses in the future and how we can potentially become better in helping our residents and trainees to become uh, well-established neurosurgeons later on. So the background, you all know this, um, that the ENS is the mother society. And the main problem we are facing in a lot of things is that the there's a large regional variability, particularly in training, but also in how neurosurgery is, is performed. This has been much more in the past and it's, it's, it's getting more equalized now, but still is a potential problem. Neurosurgery um, is probably 50% brain and 50% spine in most of the countries, and we all are faced with the European Working Time Directive, which has changed um, our way of training and our quality of training, at least that's what some studies have shown. And this is also something that is rather new, that we are more into subspecialization than we have been in the past, and we see this dramatically in the States, and it's coming to Europe in basically the same way. What's the status quo? The status quo is that um, as, of, as, as of now, this is the 2020 paper from, from Martin Steen and um, nicely showing how much exposure do residents have during training. And it's about half spine, half brain, um, and a decent number of independent procedures. And we also know that obviously some of the more easy um, operations are done quite regularly. And some of the more advanced ones, um, when you talk about complex microsurgery or skull-based surgery, is not really performed during residency. And this is probably the most important slide that we all know, and I just want to recapitulate this, that the yearly caseload per resident is increasing, is decreasing steadily, and a dramatic increase happened after the um, uh, working time directive, so that now, since about 2010, we think we are below the necessary threshold for training. Um, US is better than us. Um, obviously, there are stable numbers um, in the US, better than we have in Europe, and they are still much higher than in Europe because they have a limited access to residency training. Um, what about the working hours? Also something just to, to all, all of you are aware of this, that the working hours in in Europe are still sometimes quite high, but the time in the OR is decreasing and the time for administration is increasing. And even though most of the residents would like to work more, if they would get adequate exposure to, to clinical work, 
um, this is not possible anymore. And there are huge differences from country to country, which I don't want to go into now. So OI exposure, microsurgical training is somewhat limited and only very few people are really satisfied with this. And some of the more modern um, ways of, of training like simulator or cadaveric training is not available to most residents. There's an interest in subspecialization. We all know this, and this is coming more and more all over the world. So the problem is those decreasing numbers, and which means that we either get an improved teaching output per case, or we prolong the residency programs, which is nothing anybody really would like to have. What about um, residency training in, in Europe in the past? We had those very long hours. Um, very few residents per institution, high OR exposure, high on-call caseload. Patients didn't care much or weren't allowed to care much who does the um, operation, which is changing dramatically. And we were all basically trained in general neurosurgery and subspecialization came later. With those problems that we are facing now, the challenges of the working time directive, medical legal issues, and the number of cases per trainees, this is a problem. But there are also chances, and we're going to hear about this later on in, in this webinar, that we now have new teaching ways and teaching possibilities that we didn't have in the past, and we think we have to take advantage of those. Um, if you talk about the needs assessment, I just would just like to mention that in Austria, uh, we have a very standardized um, board certification um, exam. Um, it seems to be that the main problem that the um, trainees are facing is not the basic theoretical knowledge, but it's the clinical decision making where they have problems with. And um, this is something that's probably most difficult to address. What about the NS portfolio now? You all know the training courses with all the major neurosurgical topics and the board exam at the end. And um, this is mainly didactic lectures and, and discussion groups founded quite a long time ago. And as of now, we are able to have about half of the trainees in Europe going through that cycle um, and half don't um, because of a limitation of spots. It's continuously overbooked. And if you look at spine, there has been an equivalency, equivalency agreement with Eurospine, meaning that there has been a standardization of training, at least the theoretical training throughout Europe. We are not there for the other subdisciplines. Also important to notice that we have hands-on and advanced courses. Now we have the NS Academy, which has been pushed forward dramatically. And we have observerships that are funded by the NS, but they only reach a very limited amount of people. There's a basic training in the training course, and then um, you have the skills, the basic hands-on skills in the cranial step one and two and the spinal step one and two, which are the practicals that are supposed to add on to the specialist diploma. Um, there's also advanced courses, as you can see here, there are more practical courses and there are subspecialty courses that are currently developed, both theoretically and practical, which really helps that quite a bit. And um, this is something that it's important to note um, that we have this. So the future options for me in neurosurgical training are in-house. Um, Nora has talked about mentorship, um, about subspecialization, and we'll hear later about uh, virtual reality and simulator training. Health politics, we don't need to discuss this now, but it's obviously very important how much trainees do we have? How much admin work do our trainees and residents have to do? And what about patient expectations if you are treated at a university hospital? And the neurosurgical societies, and this is where I see the ENS, is that I think the basic courses are a good idea. The hands-on courses are important to, to go on with. And we are currently including um, virtual reality and simulator training into the training courses and even more so in the advanced courses. And I think the next step will be fellowship programs that we as a neurosurgical society can provide. The problem still is there's a huge variability um, from east to west, north to south, and standardization is difficult. Uh, I see personally that the courses have to go more into a direction like the spine courses, where there is a clear curriculum and where we potentially go through the UAMS and through the UMS, we will try to get this more standardized to reach um, all 
um, training programs within within Europe, and uh, um, particularly Peter Whitfield has put together a very nice um, proposal for the European curriculum for neurological surgery. And if we get this standardized by the help of the NS, that would be very helpful. So take home message, um, we have the general problem that we don't have as many cases per trainee as we had in the past. The quality of training is incredibly different from country to country and for even from center to center. I think there's a need for standardization. We have to have a more common board certification level throughout Europe. And the true value of the ENS courses, because that's what I was basically asked, is I think it's a good way of providing basic knowledge. But most residents are quite good at this. I see it more as a way to standardize training and to have international exchange because most young residents, let's put it that way, don't even know what an average residency program provides as a, tra as a teaching opportunity, um, both in their country and not at all in other countries. And so this collaboration also research and training wise um, should, be, should be important. We will, I think, have more simulator training in the ENS courses in the future, which will hopefully help also improve the practical knowledge. Um, and this is just to, to give you some food for thought and for the discussion later on. Thank you very much. Thank you, Claudius. We have one quick question that you can perfectly address since you are also the, the Austrian uh, training chair. How can I improve my chances of being accepted at the ENS training courses? A very difficult question that depends on the country where you're from, because it always goes through your country representative. And what we do is um, we ask for not only writing a, a filling out the form, but also maybe a motivation letter saying that you're doing a lot of research, doing this and that. And um, because for you always have to, be aware what the delegate does he sees those 50 applications and how should he or she decide which one to take so he has to use those forms and this additional information to rank the the candidates and and that's if you add information add a motivation letter that's the best you can do one more question is uh, detailing about the fellowship application for 2023. I would like to say that this is maybe not, maybe we don't know when this will be open. So probably the, the participant interested in that should get back to the EANS office probably for that, uh, for that um, particular question. So there are no more questions related to that. So I'd like to carry on with our third speaker, Sami Ridwan who is in charge of a neurosurgical educational platform. And his topic is the development of an online education platform, how to create meaning, meaningful content for neurosurgical education. Sami, please, the stage is yours. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'll just share my screen. All right, I was asked to uh, hold this talk about the development of an online education platform and how to create content for such a platform and for no surgical education. Um, I'll keep it short. Um, I actually found in neurosurgery to go.com um, about two years ago. And um, it's a platform which is free of charge and offers live webinars. As you can see here, um, neurosurgery to go is not my own work. It's uh, a part of a family, so it's called Medicine to Go. Medicine to Go was established 2012 by two gynecologists who actually had the aim to offer a free of charge education for everyone everywhere. So um, they started the project 2012. They now have almost 2,000 attendants for every webinar uh, in gynecology, almost 1,500 um, in orthopedics and uh, trauma. So as you can as you can see here, it's not only gynecology. I have to translate because it's in German. Um, it's uh, the anesthesiologists and intensivists. Um, we have integrative medicine, uh, the emergency doctors, uh, orthopedics and trauma, pediatrics, radiology, and spine to go, which is actually in English. All of the others 
are in German language. So um, our aim was to give you after working hours um, continuing medical education, which is uh, CME accredited um, from the German um, uh, medical societies. So um, it's always on air, it's live. Uh, we have experts, the who, of, who is who of uh, German speaking surgery, if you want. Um, and it's also only based on donations and sponsoring fee. We don't have the influence of other stakeholders like the industry. So Neurosurgery to Go started in September 2020. Uh, we started doing a webinar every other Tuesday of 45 minutes. And we also um, have weekend courses, but uh, not on a regular basis, which are four to four and, uh, and a half hours. Um, all our acclaimed experts in German speaking surgery, we started with 115 attendants when we started in September 2020, and we reached over 900, depending on the topic nowadays. So for spine topics, for example, we have uh, 350 to 400 for each webinar. So um, this is uh, just a screenshot from today. We have almost 2,000 active users just for neurosurgery to go. Um, for medicine to go, it's over 30,000 active users. Um, you can see um, that we have almost 1,000 German physicians, some international physicians, but also nurses, PAs, and students. Um, this is the panel of experts. Um, many of them, you know, and three of them are sitting in this panel. Uh, Nora Engler, Christian Freischlag, and uh, Professor Tomé. Um, and I'm very grateful that you participate uh, in the surgery to go. We, as I, as I showed before, you, you see that we have different target groups, different users we have to target. And um, this is not very easy um, if you are going through the topics. So we started with the neurosurgery Tuesday, which is on the highest level um, scientifically and clinically. So we have, as you can see here, it's all in German, I'll have to try to, to um, translate. We have vascular uh, topics and then followed by general topics. And we have two um, large blocks of spine topics. And for, for the younger residents and for the students, we started doing basics weekend courses where we do four or four and a half hours um, in a row with different topics on um, easier uh, things that could interest residents and students. So we can target our different user groups and uh, keep all watching. Um, we summarized all what our users liked uh, in rural surgery to go and medicine to go and what they would like uh, to have in uh, a publication um, where we surveyed all our users um, regarding the impact of COVID-19 on CME. And if you're interested, uh, this is the publication. Thank you very much for the time. I'm open for questions. Thank you, Sami. There's no question in the Q&A, but well, also we will come back to your topic in the panel right after that. So just waiting for another couple of seconds. No, no question in the Q&A. So we go to the last speaker for today and then we open up the panel. Our last speaker is Kant Azal from Non Nozare, which is a company that is um, dealing with educational and medical purposes in the metaverse. And he will talk about the value of education in the metaverse. Please, the stage is yours. Thanks a lot, Christian, and thanks again <clears throat> for inviting me. Uh, let me share my screen and then we are good to go. You already, you already see my screen, right? Okay, yes. perfect. So, um, yeah, as I said, a uh, topic, the value of education in the, in the metaverse. Uh, let's maybe onboard you a little bit. Those facts shouldn't be new to you, but basically the surg surgical training methods, they haven't really changed for decades. So we are still going for the see one, do one, teach one approach, which has been val valid since the beginning of the 19th century, actually. And the only difference, I mean, dramatizing it a little bit, the only difference today is that we use videos and PowerPoints. 
So there are some, some problems uh, uh, which already have been mentioned in, in some of the presentations uh, earlier. So when it gets to education, one big topic is time, as said, reduction in training hours and labor regulations. So, so the residents, they just don't have enough time to learn what they need to learn. Um, there is like, it's these limited standards in the training, no comparison, no immediate feedback when you train. Uh, when it gets to cadavers, which at least in spine surgery have been, you know, like the golden standards, the excess is limited and it, it is inefficient, uh, not customized to the learner's needs. On top of that, the budgets for education have been increasing, uh, decreasing, I'm sorry. And then especially when we look back to the uh, last two years, also um, it was mentioned in the presentation before, with the pandemic, the continuous education is at risk. So what are the results? Attracting talent becomes more and more difficult. It's not only that they are maybe, you know, afraid of that very, very stressful job, even when they look at the residency and what they need to do, it's, let's say, less attractive. Many surgeons are not ready to perform independently when they complete their training, and many complications are training re related, so patients are at risk. So we believe that we should do more simulation training Basically, the best example is always pilots. Uh, so what are the benefits? The exposure, the training increases the competencies while decreasing the complication rates is scalable, which means that lifelong learning for surgeons across their careers is possible, not only for the residents. Excess, the simulators, not all of them, but many of them, they enable decentralized and interrupt the training. And last but not least, they make us able to train without putting the patient at risk. So now the question is, okay, what does this have to do with the metaverse? Or let's maybe even go one step back. What is the metaverse? I don't want to bore you with like very, very long definitions. I think the easiest way to explain is, I'm pretty sure that everybody uh, attending this, this webinar has seen the movie Matrix, Matrix, okay? So the metaverse is basically a matrix, the only difference is that so far the machines, they have not taken over, you know, the control of the world. But in general, the metaverse itself and also steadily improving VR, by the way, XR, also AR technologies, they actually form the basis for inno innovative surgery training. And what I find very interesting is as Facebook or now they, are, they call themselves meta are actually right now really pushing that metaverse topic and doing also advertisements, one of the main use cases which they show is the following. In the metaverse, a surgeon will one day be able to practice virtually as many times as needed before laying her hands on a real patient. The metaverse may be virtual, but the impact will be real. So what are the education use cases, you know, starting from anatomy and pathology pathology teaching, over interactive case discussions and m and meetings, procedural know-how, surgery planning, and also OR staff, staff education. So we believe that VR will become one of the key technologies and will actually you know, provide a paradigm shift in medical training. So while in traditional training, we still follow that watch, learn, apply method, that it's, it's mainly centralized no standardization and mistakes create complications. In virtual reality training, you can train anytime and anywhere, train remotely as a team, so people can dial in from wherever they are in the world. Uh, you can practice and learn from the mistakes, again, without doing harm. Practice rare pathologies, which is, for example, difficult sometimes with, with cadavers. There's an objective evaluation possible. And last but not least, as mentioned earlier, undisrupted training even during a pandemic. So on this slide, you just see some case studies and examples. I don't want to go into uh, details that much, but in general, you know, some benefits of, of VR trained surgeons is that they are faster, they make fewer errors, they feel much more confident to really do a procedure for the, for the first time. And last but not least, VR training is significantly less expensive and also faster than traditional in-person simulation. One little deep dive, because I found it yesterday on LinkedIn, I thought it's interesting. 
uh, there was some recent research data from, from the National Training Laboratory in the US about the assimilation of knowledge, you know, while using different, let's say, teaching methods. And it's interesting to see that while, you know, with, with lecture and speech, we reach 5%, then reading goes up to 10%. This figure increases significantly to 75% when you're really able to do the stuff on your own virtually. Let me give you an example uh, uh, of such a, you know, of the usage of such a te uh, technology by coincidence, it's the company that I'm working for. Um, we have developed a virtual training center. So it's fully interactive, in, in, in a fully interactive multi-user teaching environment. It has this remote training capability. You can interact in the virtual reality classroom, ask questions, but also correct mistakes. And what I think is also very interesting to use that we use real patient data, of course, anonymized, but we uh, found a quite, let's say, efficient way to convert DICOMs into 3D models. In general, we, we offer two different implementations. On the left, uh, it's the what we call the virtual anatomy and pathology lab. It's that virtual classroom where you can together explore anatomy and pathologies, teach preoperative planning, also basic procedural know-how. And then when it gets to really doing this, uh, the procedure itself, we offer a virtual operating room where it's really like about you know what are the what is the surgical pathway, what are the steps, which instruments to use, etc. So just some some impressions uh, about the usage of our system. The two photos at the top they show uh, uh, um, uh, uh, they show like the usage of our system at this year's Global Spine Congress in Las Vegas. Uh, uh, you know they offer those pre courses, and in one of those pre courses, four very prominent uh, two more spine surgeons used our system for case discussions. Actually, so they teach their cases by using using VR. And then at the bottom, you see three pictures which have been taken earlier this year. We did a little uh, a study, pilot study with students at the University Klinik uh, Göttingen together with Dr. Maximilian Reinhold, who's leading the spine surgery there. Um, so the pilot was about, you know, there were like two groups. One group was actually trained the traditional way with a lecture and books and self-study and video, et cetera. And the other group was completely trained in VR. And I would like to show you a little video to, to, to make it give you a first idea about what happened in that virtual world. So what you see here now is, doc is that Dr. Reinhold and the students, they meet up in our multiplayer environment. You, when he has a presentation board, we, we can show his slides, show some, some, some videos. Here, he's showing the correct entry points for the pedicle screws on the 3D model. He's also using our interactive DICOM viewer, where you can even superimpose, as you can see, the DICOMs on the 3D model. Then they switch over to a virtual OR and actually practice the, the procedure, the pedicle screw fixation. We have some interactive guides, also, you know, guiding beginners about what to do. And as this is a multiplayer environment, handling tools between users is possible so you can really do the procedure together. So as this is not a sales pitch, I'm going to be completely open also regarding the limitations of virtual reality slash the metaverse today, because I think if, uh, many of you already thought about virtual reality and you ask yourself, well, okay, what about haptics? What about learning psychomotor skills, which are so important for surgeons? And the honest answer is today, there is no haptic device in the market, which is really fulfilling your needs. There's already some prototypes, a lot of startups are working on it, but not it's, it's not there yet. It will, there will be in the future. And until then, we need to get creative. And maybe one more thing, we believe that, at least for now, there is no single technology which is solving all the learning needs. It's not there yet. And let me give you an example of how different technologies can be combined. 
Um, so this is about combining virtual reality and biomimetic simulators. When I mean biomimetic simulators, I mean those you know haptic workstations, those synthetic cadavers. If you combine them, they can be used for providing a, what we call 360 degree learning experience. So whereas in virtual reality, you can create an understanding of the anatomy, the pathologies, also the procedural learning itself, the psychomotor skills are then really practiced with by using real surgical tools on that biomimetic simulator. Maybe some of you, <coughs> I'm sorry, maybe some of you have, have heard about the company Realists or Real Spine. It's a company from Germany, from Leipzig. They are doing those, those, psycho, uh, those biomimetic simulators and we started collaborating. Um, what I'm going to show you next is a, a short video uh, from the first pilot that we did in Aachen, also in Germany. So imagine that the, 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 the learners, they got together in VR, they got introduced into the, into the case, anatomy, pathology, the procedure itself, what to do. And afterwards, they put off the, the, the goggles, went to those realist haptic stations, really did the hands-on procedure. And in the afternoon, they met again in VR to discuss adjacent cases. Here we go. Just to just one last one last uh, uh, comment. Uh, um, the, the the second uh, let's say pilot takes place this Friday and Saturday uh, in New York at this year's NYC MISSS course, uh, which is going to be facilitated by Dr. Roger Hertel. And again, they're going to combine both ours and realist simulators for providing that learning experience. That's it from my side. Thank you very much. I'm very looking forward to the discussion. Thank you for that visionary talk. We have one quick question before we enter the panel discussion. Are you aware of either your technology or any other VR technology for neurosurgical education that is available in Africa? I am not, not for now, but I would say as is, you know, in the end, I mean, that's, that's uh, both, uh, uh, I'm speaking for us, but also for our competitors, as we are providing software as a service and the hardware investment is very, very low, there is no, no reason why not to offer it in, in, in African countries as well. So people should probably get in touch with you or yeah, yeah. who else is offering a, a very yeah. similar service. So we just entered the panel discussion. I'd like to introduce on top of our speakers, Yiri Bartek from the Karolinska Institute who has been recently appointed the residency director, Cesare Soja from the University of Pavia, and Marlies Bauer from also Innsbruck Medical University, who is uh, unfortunately to, 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 due to a little illness unable to speak to us. So she's joining and maybe typing in the chat, but she will not be able to speak. So the question was, are we fit for the future? Is our sophisticated training not so sophisticated anymore? And how is the training fitness for the future? So first of all, I'd like to ask one question that it comes straight out of the Q&A still, which is for, for um, Nora. Could you briefly allude to the mentorship model for residents at Charité in your surgery? Of course. So um, we believe in the mentorship concept and um, everyone who starts 
has a mentor who is two or three years senior. So already in the beginning of your residency, you have someone that you can directly ask and ask about everything. This means your scientific development, who to ask, um, who to go to for what, which secretary is responsible for what, which, um, which um, senior physician is responsible for what. So we have this on a low level, but we also have this afterwards if it comes to competencies. So as we are a large university clinic, we have every subspecialty in our hospital. So if it is decided in which subspecialty you go, you get a mentor who is um, who's giving you some advice and some exposure um, on how to develop scientifically and, and clinically. So we, we have this very active on, on different steps of your of your education. We're facing a lot of change at the moment. The working time directive was mentioned. New technologies were mentioned, um, online education. But this is not the end of change. You know, we, we will face a, a world that will be changing even quicker. Somebody who's 40 now, like I am, when we're 60 in 2040, the rate of paradigm change will be four times as quick as it's today. So that will also be a problem in training. And we all know that from an educational perspective, the expert surgeon is doing things because he or she knows how to do things. And the young resident or student is thinking things. How do we get our young residents from thinking to doing, Cesare? Thank you for the question, Christian. Uh, I think uh, there are two levels uh, on uh, about we have to reason on. The, the first is that we have to improve, as said from the, pan the, the panelist, the simulation. I have experience with uh, simulation courses and works very well. Uh, it, they are cost effective because they are less expensive than cadaveric courses. They not uh, substitute cadavers till now, but I think in the future it will be uh, this the direction, and uh, they can mm, they are more easy to organize. And I think in this period, uh, virtual reality and augmented reality are very nice uh, technology. But simulation is better because we are we do a practical work. And we need to shift from uh, the ancient method of training to a new one. This is correct. But we, we have to pass to a practical thing, showing how to do something. And simulation is the perfect way to, to show it. Combined, of course, with, with augmented reality or virtual reality, that's, that's, uh, it works. I, I personally organize some hybrid courses uh, for example, the first day you do a, a procedure on a simulators, and the second day you use you do the same procedure on a cadaver, and the learning curve is faster and grow grow faster. And so I think the the first word uh, to underline is simulation to help us improving training, and the second uh, is uh, uh, um, how to say uh, co collaboration. I, I I have read a question. How is possible to do research in low middle income countries? Uh, I, I know that it's very difficult, but uh, low middle income countries have a huge caseload and have a huge opportunity to train and to perform surgery that we do not have anymore. And so we, we have uh, like US or other high income countries uh, a lot of opportunity of research, doing research, but we do not have so many patients. So we have to collaborate in a world level. And the society, like our society, has to promote this collaboration. And so I think this, these are the two main things. One practical is simulation, and the second one, uh, collaboration between uh, 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 countries and hospital. Uh, I just finished my first comment uh, with underlying another time uh, the importance of uh, a mentor. 
because uh, we can uh, have all the technology and all the stuff we want, but if we do not have someone near us that teach us step-by-step -step procedure and so on, and not only teach us uh, how to do something, but uh, also uh, a little bit of philosophic uh, way to see neurosurgeon, uh, how, to, how to, to, to stop you when it's not uh, a good uh, proceed, how to do things, how to also relation with uh, the patient and so on. Uh, I think we, we, we could speak for hours about technology and empowering education, but without a mentor, we do not go anywhere. Thank you. John, John how, do you, how do you get the thinkers to, do, to the doers? No, I mean, the, the thing is, uh, Christian, uh, I, can, I can only re really, really uh, uh, um, say, uh, uh, you know, Cesare, uh, uh, I, com I, I, I agree with them. This is what I also tried to say in my presentation, you know. Um, our goal is not to say, you know, hey, we're bringing like this new technology and this will replace everything. That, that's, that's not going to happen. Of course, you know, in, in, in VR, you can do a lot. With, but without the haptics. So of course you can repeat stuff as much, uh, you know, as, as often as you want. And this of course has, you know, huge like learning benefits for it. But as said, you need to combine it with, with other technologies for really reaching that end-to-end -end, end -end learning. So I can only agree to what Cesare said. I'd like to, to, to put up another point, not, not only training when we have students or residents, but to go before that, how do we pick our students or residents? It's, it's one more thing. Yiri, how do you pick your, your residents? What's the criteria for that? So that's obviously a secret. So. <laughs> No, so, <clears throat> so that's a very good question, Christian, and there is no easy answer. It's probably uh, many different things, many different aspects. Uh, uh, finally, to be honest, at least here in Sweden, it's not my decision. It's the decision of the, uh, of the, uh, of the department head who becomes the next resident. Uh, so I'm only in charge of the residents that actually already got their contract signed, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> But uh, yeah, but it's of course I can come with advice, and I we usually uh, we usually discuss uh, we discuss it not just between me and the department head, but between all the senior staff members at the at the department. Um, the Nordic system might be a little bit difficult to the, many of the uh, of the you know systems in rest of Europe. So, for instance, we don't have uh, direct. Um, application so people don't apply directly to us for residency position usually they stay at least let's say one year or so working at our department as a junior doctor and then if we need a resident we usually pick one of the residents that work there okay or one of the sorry one of the younger doctors that work there <clears throat> so we have time to to um, to basically evaluate uh, the person and also the person has time to to evaluate us do he does he or she want to stay and want to apply for a possible residency position? But yeah, it's 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 a combination of a lot of things. Obviously, curiosity, but it also has a lot of to do about social skills, character, right? Learning curve. Does the person show uh, interest? Does the person show that they they can uh, learn? Um, do, are they are good with the hands, right? So there are many. And I mean, many of these criteria are probably also a, a, a little bit old school, but but it's still a surgical specialty. So it's probably will be like this for many years to come, to be honest. Sami, how do you pick the residents? Well, the problem is, uh, as you know, in Germany, there are uh, not so many residents for all of us because the working directive, I think every clinic has many more uh, too much or too too many residents uh, working there um, just to cover the shifts. So I think this is the problem we have in Germany that you cannot really educate all the residents to become good surgeons. Um, 
we used to pick our residents at the university um, in Bonn um, due to these criteria. Um, but nowadays, uh, you're happy if a resident comes your way <laughs> in smaller hospitals, um, as many of you might might know. So. Um, yeah, I think everything changed, so we can't we can't be so too picky these days, depending on the hospitals you work in. I was actually expecting that people will rely on some kind of tests, grades, or um, whatever no, no uh, grades in the end of study. But this is this seem, doesn't seem to be the case. So my my, my point is gone there. Tesara has raised his hand. Yeah, just pick them. Tomorrow. Quick report from Italy. Of course, uh, we, have, we have a national uh, examination, general, so not, not only for neurosurgery. Uh, but uh, I want just to tell a, a little joke. A big friend of mine uh, always said that the best test to pick a resident is just to put, uh, give him a, 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 a nail and just said, okay, put this nail in the wall and hang a picture. So do something practical, because we have a lot of tests that measure how a resident has studied, how he is prepared in anatomy and a lot of things. But we do not have practical exercise to evaluate is if he or she is able to do something with the hand. That is our work. It's just a joke, but I think that we can be also a point of discussion. Well, probably you will have to have a big wall and a lot of nails. Um, let, me, let me give you a quote, a quote by Geoffrey West. He's a physicist. And the quote is, rather than being bored to death, our actual challenge is to avoid anxiety attacks, psychotic breakdown, breakdowns, heart attacks, and strokes resulting from being accelerated to death. We were talking about working time directives, the need for more and more residents to, to cover our hospitals, to cover our calls. And now, instead of having a lot of residents with, um, let's say, a, a relaxed and bored day, we have different things to fear. Nora, you were actually in my, in my focus for that question anyway. How, how do we overcome the, the, the anxiety attacks, the breakdowns, the heart attacks, the strokes? You, you think of breakdowns, then you think of me? Okay, thank you. No, I think, I think of you have the solution, not of a breakdown. No, I mean, th there is a dynamic in that. So when I think back at the time where I was a resident, um, my boss just started where I work at now. So it was war every day. If you were on call, this was like you were on the front line. So um, nothing was organized in the department. So you had to answer phones, you had to like do um, and go into the outpatient clinic, go to the OR, you have to cover for everything. And now everything is a little bit better organized and um, you better know what to do, but your exposure of course is less. And um, this is a contribution from the pandemics, but now we also have to face that the nurses run out so we don't have any nurses anymore. So if even if we have the cases, they cut us down the ORs. So it's a multi-dimensional problem. And um, so if you went through that front line, you have your confidence is just higher if, if you did not go through that. So um, I think the training aspects, what John said, I think it's a good idea to have multiple sides of a puzzle to bring in, you know, sometimes your hands know what to do, not your brain has to know what you do. So from that perspective, I think it is very, very valuable to have training possibilities where you can actually do something. However, um, for us as a department, um, we somewhat changed the structure. So if you now fi um, finish your residency and you go into the past that you possibly do the background so that you are responsible, we give you someone more experienced at hand, which means that you are able to perform the small procedures or you have to cover the small decisions, but you always have someone that you can call to, um, it's, this is, I think, what, what Claudius also said, that the decision-making thing is an issue. And this is something which may give you a heart attack because this is, of course, if you are there and if it's, there is major bleeding, then you have to do something. But this is something on a manual level. And I think um, 
If you have enough exposure, you can learn. However, the intellectual process, sometimes you need the experience and it's good to have someone at hand who can give you advice, who has a little bit more experience. And we change that in our uh, coverage system of, of calls. So just one, one aspect. Claudius, how do you overcome your, your residents' anxiety attacks? Well, that's that's obviously difficult. No, I think the my, no, my our residents are quite good, so I'm happy with them. But but um, it's always a matter of um, how much pressure you put on them. The problem uh, I'd like to also follow up with, uh, with Nora here. Um, the problem is also quite often decision making. I mean, what you're talking, I was like to give a comment on on on, on the discussion a little bit. Um, all great topics and and great points simulation no doubt about this vr perfect um i love it but i think we have to we have to keep in mind there are two ways in in training our our residents one is actually the manual training and i sometimes have the impression you focus too much on the manual training and i would like to follow up on with nora saying that the decision making is also very important the intellectual training on how to deal with patients. And I would like to make a comment as the old guy in, in, in the room um, that what I have to, what I would like to point out is that the, the residents need to learn how to be efficient and focused when learning. And this is lacking quite often because um, in the past, I mean, we, we, we had so many cases that it didn't matter to us, but now we have few cases. So the teaching experience from each case has to be higher. And this can be only partly overcome by simulation of VR. And the problem is that the residents have to have a different attitude. And I think that has changed sometimes. I don't want to criticize the young generation. But if you go into a case perfectly prepared, you've read the books, you've looked at two videos online, then you'll get 10 times the teaching experience in comparison if you have not done this. And this is also a mindset that I'm sometimes missing a little bit. Um, uh, we didn't have to do it. We didn't have that mindset, I, I have to admit. But we didn't have to have it because we had enough cases. But now with a few cases, I think the residents have to have a different mindset to make, get more out of each case. That's a good point. Getting, getting much out of the case is a, a point I want to touch on as well. Um, there were studies about uh, countries where residents have to file a logbook of surgeries. And interestingly, about 50% of the residents, they file the surgery as their surgery, as their case, when they've done 50% and more of it, which is okay, I would say. But 30% of residents file the case as their case when they've done 25 or less percent of the case themselves. So we all know the, 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 the great stories about people running around PGY1 telling you they did six meningioma cases the week. And you, everybody of us knows they've done just a little tiny piece of the operation. So what, what's, what's, what's our touch on that? When, when is the case your case? And how do we take care of the residents being trained in the OR and not being taken away from the case by a hurried uh, consultant and uh, who wants to do the case themselves. Yiri. Yeah, thank you, Christian. Okay, I also had a question to Claudius, but I can, I can take that afterwards. But okay, I can give you an example on that. Um, so how do we make sure, I mean, there is no easy way. Um, and, and I know the problem that you just highlighted, the fact that some residents in um, might, one might say, take credit for something that's not theirs, right? Their work. Um, and um, here in the Nordics, we do have, as you mentioned, something very similar to the, to the log books. Okay, so that we fill out and ask the residents to fill out and they, they ask to, to observe some cases, assist at some cases, and then do the cases themselves, okay? And there are certain numbers for, depending on case and patient and diagnosis, obviously. Uh, then something we tried here at our institution, which did work to at least some extent, which, which might improve that, what, what you mentioned as well, is to make the residents focus on certain areas at a time, okay? So, so we have a 
obviously neuros and neurosurgery is very broad, right? You have many subspecialties. So what we try to do, the residency program here is uh, six or six to six, six and a half years, uh, that they spend six months within one subspecialty. Obviously, they also still do the on calls, right? But but when they are working daytime, they work within one subspecialty. So you do spine for six months. Okay, so then you assist and you do your own spine cases every day, basically. And that's what you do for those six months. And at the end of the six months, you ask the section head of the spine section, so is this resident well enough trained to, to you know, to make sure that he or she can handle spine cases on an emergency level as an attending. If they say no, the resident has so far not proven themselves, you know, good enough or whatever you want to call it, then they have to extend their stay at that section. Okay, so maybe that's that could be one way. I mean, this sort of work for us. The problem becomes when when the residents suddenly have to do too many on calls and have too little daytime activity. Then then obviously this this model doesn't work. But this is one way to sort of expose them to certain pathologies within a limited uh, you know, time span but to make them focus. So that is just an idea, but it sort of, it, it does work here. And, and my, um, my question to Claudius was, I, I, I completely agree um, and, and um, with what you said. Uh, the, the question there is also, so, so for the residents to be prepared more for the case, so obviously there are different ways to prepare you have you can you know catch up on things you read the patient history look at the imaging so how do we how do we make them you know get the most out of their time what do you guys do at your institution i'm just curious because here sometimes it's difficult you sort of get you know the residents comes and if if they're not placed in one section specifically as i mentioned they might just come up to an attending and say oh you're doing this tumor case in 30 minutes, can I just join in? Can I scrub in? And then the exposure is probably not that big. Uh, the attending might not wanna you know, hand over the instruments to the resident because the resident might not have enough time to be prepared. So do you have a, like a routine for that in some way that you tell them, okay, in two days, you're gonna do this case or you're gonna assist on this case, please prepare in this manner or that manner or something. No, actually that that, that is that is a, problem in everyday practice particularly now because our schedule now because of the shortage of personnel we change our our schedule basically hourly um, which makes planning very difficult so right now we have a real problem in doing that in an ideal world when and normally we, we, we are quite good at knowing already what we do next week or the week after on elective cases um, so in that normal circumstances um, you you can do that better we try to um, talk through the surgeries at our noon or early afternoon conference every day and try to discuss those issues, what you what you have to prepare, what are the peculiarities of the case. But I still think most of it is the own responsibility of the residents. When he's on the OR schedule, um, there's enough time when the OR schedule is out at two or three in the afternoon to really look at what kind of cases, look at the images, prepare him or herself, talk to the attending, you do the operation with. Uh, so I think it's more the responsibility at this point in time of the, of the residents, to be honest. Let me just put a quick question in there, touching on that to, to Chan. If a resident um, figures out he's gonna be, he or she gonna be in the OR tomorrow morning at, I don't say, I don't know, 3 p.m. now, um, how long does it take to get the case prepared in, in for example, in your particular platform, to 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 walk through the case in your platform. To like, if it's, uh, I mean, in this case, we're talking about the pre-op side of it. That takes us less than half a day today. And if our research project with Charité, by the way, that we just won works out well, then it will be fully automized. So then it will be a question of question of minutes. But that's that's the future, right? Just maybe just one more comment because I think uh, this is very interesting because at the DKOU Congress in for, for orthopedics and, and uh, trauma surgery, we, we talked with one of the, the uh, spine spine professors and he basically said, you know, that's actually what I want to have in the future is that if the residents comes to join the surgery, I want to be sure that he or she has actually is is prepared. You know, in, basically with VR, you can, you can ensure that given the metrics. 
So the teacher, I'll call the teacher for a second, can actually see, okay, you know, did, did, did he or she do the, the uh, uh, you know, homework or not, right? Just one question from the Q&A that fits perfectly to Yiri's comment before I read his question. Do you recommend an in-residency fellowship? In-residency fellowship, as in a fellowship you do during your residency, right? So- Yes, the, that's how I got the question. Oh, yeah. So yeah, I understand it the same way. Uh, so uh, definitely, um, I would, I mean, this is also something that we're trying to sort of, um, is not, to be honest, not been a huge tradition, but something that we're working on uh, within the Nordics, that is, that we have uh, like a, a subspecialty possibility for the residents for six months when they sort of can do what they would like to do. They can either stay at our institution and say, okay, I probably do want to do oncology. I take another six months in the oncology section, and do maybe diff more difficult cases or they get some funding at least, and they can travel for three to six months somewhere else in the Nordics to learn something that we don't offer here. That could be, for instance, uh, lumbar spine uh, surgery, which we don't have here in, in, in Sweden. This, uh, this is mostly done by the orthopedics. So you can travel to Norway or Denmark and learn that, or endovascular. That's also something that we're trying to to build up uh, for those that might be interested in the future. I think it's a good idea as, as long as it's something that you sort of are not forced to do, but it's an optional thing. So if this is something that where the resident thinks, okay, this is something I would like to do, but I'm not sure, or this is something I know I will do in the future. I want to learn more and, and to travel That's somewhere. Great because we it's great because we and also Berlin and some other centers are involved in this EU funded uh, an aid pro project where residents are forced or invited, of course, but forced to travel around um, and see different departments and specialties there. And they are traveling for, I think, eight months. They spend some time in their home department and they're traveling and see different ways of, of doing surgery in specialized centers. And that's something we'd like to, to, we're very interested in the results in training wise for those candidates who do that, that um, rotational uh, travel, which is very interesting. Noah, you raised your hand. Um, yes, I just want to connect a little bit uh, with what, what Claudia say about preparation of cases um, and um, to what Chan said, how, how can you make sure that the resident is prepared for a case so we for cranial cases we use slack and we ask everyone to do a craniotomy perspective so that he or she is connected with the advising or senior physician um, that um, the team talked about the case and this is transparent to the whole clinic because in our department we have three different sites and the close connection to each other is not always possible that's why we do a lot of things electronically and in the morning in the morning rounds or morning talks, there are a lot of conferences come up. So we, we try to standardize this and to do it more transparent for the cranial cases. However, for spinal cases, it wouldn't possibly make sense to. But this is just the first step. We use Slack for that. I'm curious about that. But is that does that mean that the team from the from the from the site has talked the craniotomy through? Is it the resident who does the craniotomy who is responsible for presenting it via Slack to the others? Well, we right this the, the last one. So um, our OR management wants us to have a first draft of the OR plan ready at three p.m. So we try to be um, early, and we also try to connect people to the cases as early as possible. And we slack that at least in the evening um, when when everything is set. Of course, we all know how uh, daily daily life is at the moment, and that we have to change a lot of things due to shortage of personnel. However, this gives everyone the chance to prepare one day before, um, and it is the rule that you have to prepare the way you are going to approach a tumor, um, and that you line that down and you put it in the slack which is called the planning of the craniotomy and then you have to put it down um, the way you position your patient the way you access the tumor and so on so it's transparent for everyone that the resident did uh, prepare for it that sounds quite familiar to me um i don't know where this comes from me neither. Um, 
Cesare, Yiri, how do you do that? In, in Innsbruck, it's the same. We don't use Slack for that, but residents who are allowed to do tumor cases, they have to prepare a very short, like three slide PowerPoint, short presentation of the patient, of the positioning of the craniotomy. And then they are usually asked by either Claudius or myself where they see potential problems in that surgery, where they start the resection um, and so on. How do you do that with your residents? Yeah, I, I do the same, um, not with technology, but uh, just uh, with PowerPoint presentation uh, in the morning. I was teaching like that because during my residency, we have uh, to prepare the case of the day after. And uh, early in the morning at half past seven, we have a short presentation about the cases. And if the pathology is rare, also a brief review of the literature or something like that. So you have to, to be prepared. And uh, this is uh, also my, my philosophy. Uh, I, uh, I never uh, let uh, 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 a resident scrub with me if he cannot answer a simple question, what we are gonna do, which are the steps of the, of the surgery, uh, what, what, what kind of craniotomy you will perform, what, yeah, the, the, the normal step of the surgery should be no, because if someone just came to move uh, his hand or her hand, uh, can stay out of the operatory room for me. So it's, it's up to the resident, uh, like, like Claudius uh, says before, be prepared and show uh, to the uh, mentor or the teacher or the attendant how uh, is uh, involved in the surgery. And of course, if I see that there is someone that is a lot involved, I let him do more. That's normal way to do the things. I mean, if someone doesn't even know the history of the patient, for me, maybe the skin, maybe. Yuri? Yeah, so, so I, I'm also very, so to be honest, we don't have like a standardized way to do it. And I'm very curious and, and about the way that you guys do it. This is my, maybe something that we should implement as well. Um, but we have the like unofficial way to do it that, that obviously a day before the, the consultant attending speaks to the resident that's going to uh, help uh, him or her or do their own case the next day. And then they walk through the steps that's going to be done. So, so they ask the questions. Uh, I, I think Cesare, your and our way is probably very similar. Um, but to get back to what, what you said, Denora, so, so how does it work? So you guys actually ask the residents to prepare or, or even at your institution, Christian and Claudius, to, to prepare slides specifically for the case for the next day, and they present the slides. So, so where do they present that? Once again, you said the day before, even or was morning was conference it? with us in the morning conference. In the end, when we talk about the on-call cases, our ICU patients, the daily OR schedule, and then in the end, at the daily OR schedule review, you see that the resident is doing a tumor case. And then the next point is always how how is they are they prepared where's the where's the PowerPoint and then they talk that through so it's always in like in the end of the morning conference for like five minutes or something or something like probably that. Something, something like that okay I'd like to have I like to, to pose two more questions from the from the Q and A one goes to Cesare who already raised his hand so it's it's the nice um, takeover. Do you know if and how residents present cases in other Italian centers? Uh, just to add a thing and then I answer. Also that the briefing is very important by us. Uh, reviewing what we have done during the operation and discuss about what could be done better or what were the errors and so on. It's just an informal discussion, maybe going to eat something after the operation, but I always perform, we always perform like I think everyone this kind of the briefing with, uh, uh, with the residents. I, I think that also a more structured briefing uh, uh, could be done. Uh, I was in Pittsburgh uh, during my residency for a fellowship and they, on weekly basis, uh, the, the youngest the residents uh, go through all the cases of the week and uh, 
mortality and morbidity cases. And there is a huge discussion about that. And I, I think it's a big learning opportunity. Uh, in Italy, of course, there are differences in center by centers, but uh, uh, in the most of, uh, of the center, I, I, I have the feeling and I have, I knew a lot of people of different centers and it works uh, similarly. Someone is more structured, have a logbook, have uh, more technology and have presentation during the morning and so on. So other center has just a discussion, but uh, it's most of, in most of the center is like that. Uh... So I, I think we can, can, we come near to the end of our webinar and I'd like to pose a, like a last question to give us also some food for thoughts, con touching on the topic of the discussion, are we fit for the future? And I'd like to start um, with the question, are we fit for the future? By um, reading out one of Marlis's comments that um, she said, we, there are several ways to empower residents. We should, we should do more of that, positive reinforcement, support innovation, give second chances, provide a platform and some, some mentorship. and be better and be perfect in dividing um, the residents' um, time they have, given that this is limited. I can agree on that. And I'd like to start um, just with the panel here. Nora, what, what do we have to do? Are we fit for the future? And what is the foremost thing we have to change to become fit for the future? Oh, well, I think mentorship is important. Um, and I don't know if you, you can say this is your mentor or not. There is a lot of talking involved. So um, talk a lot to each other and get to know each other. Uh, give second chances. I think this is important. And sometimes I see this. Sometimes I say, okay, maybe I'm too nice because I sometimes say, okay, you are on call. Your call is calm. Just come in, do the surgery. I prepare a little for you. Then you can do that thing. So, I mean, it's it works both ways. So um, maybe uh, residents should think about getting prepared the best way they could. And senior physicians should really try to empower them and to be supportive. They should be able to give and take. Right. Claudius. Well, I, I agree with what has been said. I don't, to be honest, I don't think we are fit for the future. Um, I think we, we, we are not good enough with our simulation and VR things because it's not available enough at this point in time. It may be in the future and I think it's affordable, um, but I'm, I'm more worried about the general attitude issue on both sides, on the side of the mentee and or trainee and on side of the mentor and trainer um and i think this is something that we have to standardize more i like the the basic mentor mentee thing but the issue is always that the mentor has the impression he doesn't get enough out of it and it's only for the purpose of the mentee so this is very important that this is a give and take as nora has already pointed out um and i'm I, i'm i'm still a bit worried about um how we will manage to do this in the future with those very limited working hours, to be honest. John, are we fit for the future? I think no, otherwise you don't need us. Um, no, you have to think no. Okay. <laughs> no, no, just just kidding. Uh, I think, you know, like, I mean, the technology is evolving rapidly. So let's see what, what the next years are going to show us. However, I think the technology needs to work in a way, and it can be VR, also other technologies, in a way that both the mentees and the mentors are benefiting from it. And this needs to be developed. And in the end, it won't be only some fancy startups doing this. Uh, it needs to be uh, done collaboratively with you guys. Yuri, how's the, how's the future fitness? And what's the foremost thing we will have to change soon? Uh, I, I think I, I agree, especially what Claudio said, uh, and not only in terms of like the mentor versus the mentee in terms of residency, but even if you go, you know, lower and, and you, let's say, for instance, uh, look at uh, medical, uh, medical school students, okay, these days, they expect a lot of you in terms of teaching, dedicated time, 
and so on. But but I think the mentality is changed in terms of that when I was a medical student, and I was a really, <laughs> but when I was a medical student, that you 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 know you stayed after hours to learn extra, or you spend time reading upon things at home. But these days, it's more sort of that that the expectations are much higher in terms of being served a lot of solutions, uh, and getting getting um, um, you know. So so I don't know if it's the right way or the wrong way. I mean, it's a good way that, that there is some sort of evolution, and times are changing, obviously. Um, but um, I think more, as Claudia said, more on both parts, uh, like both from the mentor and the mentee, that it should be like a joint relationship um, in many ways. And I don't think it's going in that direction, unfortunately. It's, I think it's more and more gliding apart. And, and this is something I think we should try to focus on. Cesare, what's the first and foremost thing to change? I think uh, the, the things, the most important thing to think, to change just one, just one is our mentality. Uh, the mentality is changing. And so to answer the, the big question, I think we are pretty fit for the future, but I'm pretty sure that the future is fit for us. What does it mean? Uh, if we uh, are change our mentality and we we can accept the changing of medicine of neurosurgeon take a look of what happens in the 90s for uh, vascular surgery and the vascular came into the field and everything has changed and who the person that does not accept accept this change is nonsense nowadays so we have to change our mentality be prepared for the future and only in this way we can be fit for the future. Great. Thank you all for your time. Thank you all at home for watching. I'd like to wish you all a very nice holiday season. Take some time off and take some time to recharge. And we'll see you next year with the next Young Neurosurgeon Committee webinars. Have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much.